This section on the theory of art concerns categories. In the earlier presentation of the High Renaissance, I noticed a particular cosmology became highly influential in Florence. That is to say, Marsilio Ficino took Eros from Plato's symposium, and along with universals such as the math and geometry of divine proportion, this inspired many of the great artists, philosophers, and governments of the time to consider such virtues as a motivational factor and led them into a pursuit of excellence. In the arts, when Plato's Eros is rescued from lust and taken to pure, transcendent ideas, Eros, or beauty in the arts, lifted people from their daily concerns to a position of wholeness and hence to higher transcendent ground, which for the sake of argument we will call Logos, a source of universal virtues and a ground for redemptive healing where needed. Artists, musicians, poets, and social leaders all strove to put such principles into action as a pragmatic reality. All this attempted to bring the psyche and soul to wholeness, to joy, and to a profound sense of empathy with others, and to a sense of belongingness in the cosmos in which they dwelt. This is why this short period in cultural history is defined by the term idealism, and why such idealism can further be defined as profoundly relational. Philosophers came to call this theory the way up and the way down. In the presence of beauty, the mind moved to a type of psychological wholeness and peace, then to higher contemplative or blissful states, then to a high transcendent realm of dwelling in a non-dual state with the one. All proceeded from the one, they said, and an elevated mind, divine mind, returned by the same road back to the one. In beauty, there was lure for this mind, but never coercion. In unification thought, this relational process, the relation to the one, is simply defined as a purpose, a purpose and meaning to life defined by Ficino as love. This cosmology was organic by nature, a systems theory, and marked by empathy for others just as cells in a biological system do the same, communicate openly to one another, share vitally and dynamically, and all this becomes sustainable if maintained in that fashion. From the Renaissance, we also discovered artists were previously listed as craftsmen, often tied to guilds. They were workers. However, by the high period, artists broke loose and became individuals gifted with immense talent. They became genius by definition. This term runs into the period of German idealism and into Kant's attempt to define the aesthetic. However, any genius starts in family, hence categories, including genius, are predicated to love and empathy, where the first lessons of creativity and socialization are discovered within the early family crucible. These paintings by Gainsborough, Dance, Vermeer, John Everett Millet, and Lord Leighton come from around the same period and show subject matter ranging from family to domesticity to the portrayal of an object of desire, Lord Leighton's image of beauty, that which is loved. But from these categories are extracted husband, wife, and children, three major categories which may seem oversimplified, but bear with me. Logos and Eros run from deep historical traditions, going back at least to ancient Egypt. Logos, the name, is the work of Heraclitus, who lived in Ephesus around 500 BCE. The term sublime emerged with Longinus, who wrote a treatise on the sublime. His dates are obscure, but he lived around the 2nd century AD. By 1750, Baumgarten supplies us with the idea, aesthetic, meaning simply a sense of beauty. But in 1757, Edmund Burke in Britain published a treatise on aesthetics, 
a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful, which attracted the attention of prominent continental thinkers, including Immanuel Kant. It is Kant, mostly from the Critique of Judgment in 1790, who tells us it is the genius who creates great works, and these works are by intention. There is a purpose and a heart to it all. That is to say, the genius brings into existence aesthetic ideas, and it is the genius who, from a harmonious state of mind, creates from beauty and sublimity, which is found in nature, in deep ecology. From heart, the genius strives to promote the basic virtues of the good, the beautiful, and the true. One can argue here that these concepts embrace the nature of the mature and sensitized self, and from the nature of the transcendent cosmological ground to which it belongs, and does so with a purpose to serve others as a mature self might, and as a narcissistic self might not. In proposing some of this, the term heart may not be so clear in Kant's portfolio, but in expressing judgments of taste, Kant is suggesting his genius supplies soul or spirit to what would otherwise become unimaginative, uninspiring, meaningless, and dry work. What then is the sublime in the arts? Categories are an economy of thought followed by layers of subdivisions, basically an idea extracted from Aristotle. A forest, for example, might be a category. Trees might be the first subdivision, and a type, such as oak or larch, would be a tertiary subdivision. Fatherly beauty is such a category, predicated to masculine and to logos. It may form as magnanimous beauty, broad beauty, solemn, profound, vast, and awesome beauty. Practically speaking, we are seeing it presented in works here, defined by the sublime in some way or another, in Turner, Bierstadt, Friedrich, Daw, Rothko, and Church. The father and son picture reveals the emotional content. It boils down to the experience the infant has being thrown into the vast universe where an adventure of awe and excitement awaits if the relationship is secure. This tends to be a kind of definition of what masculine is. Motherly beauty, our second category, is predicated to something quite different, the feminine and eros. It is relational beauty, graceful beauty, noble, warm-hearted, delicate, gentle, passionate beauty. Beauty is concerned more with intimacy and empathy which another German idealist supplies us in his philosophical work. Theodore Lips introduces empathy, the unconscious, in his Empathy, Psychology, and Aesthetics, and it is from a psychological perspective now emerging that we might add the notion of repair. That is to say, art can also become redemptive, reparative, or healing by its nature. In this sense, empathy in art is drawn into a psychological perspective, particularly through attachment theories and the work of Carl Rogers, but more of this later. Children's art unfolds as our third category in well-observed stages, but through the research of Alan Dissimayaki, we see that the art impulse in our homo aestheticus is an innate agency within the self, and important not only as art, but as a social and cohesive force. In child art, it starts as finding objects which the child makes special. It could be something as simple as a colored stone. But this is only the start of a journey which moves through play to deeper ceremonies, to ritual, so that art, emotional experiences, and culture lends itself to social cohesion. Here we look at paintings, concerts, literature, social gatherings, even as small as a dinner with a group, 
so that this broad theory starts simply, but ends as the glue which holds the social fabric together, and likewise proffers the simple element of joy and gathering for whatever aesthetic reason it might hold to. It becomes simply our way of life, and a way of life in celebration of life. Attached to this is concerned consciousness. A. N. Whitehead says the act of creation, the creator is both conscious and immensely concerned with every single detail, every small particle of his work, so that what we dream up and introduce to the social fabric matters just as much, because we affect one another in the same way, profoundly. Principles, archetypes, logos, eros, and dynamics attached to these expressions offer us a chance to elevate one another and to make life better. Good art does this. Good art defines an ascent of man. Who then is the genius of Kant is correct? Perhaps Joseph Campbell has a simple yet profound explanation extracted from a lifelong passion with myth. It is the one, he says, who feels such a calling, and the one who follows one's bliss. One is happy, deeply so, in discovering one's internal reality. Therefore, there is a passionate sense of commitment to one's character, calling, and the pursuit of excellence, which then offers the best hope of seeing something new yet virtuous, emerging into the human landscape. Many thanks.